Hello and welcome to Hair in the Hawthorne. How are you all doing? And today, as well as having Neil back, um, he's been sort of a little bit absent, absent with the uh, paranormal shows that I've been putting on. So we, we have him back co-hosting with me this evening. I'm a little bit nervous about tonight and I'll tell you why. So the guest that we've got sitting on the virtual sofa with us is somebody who was I have very few people who inspire me within the paranormal community to the to the point of this person. And I guess this evening, my, I was just saying my um, internal teenager, when uh, I knew I was having this guest on, we were having this guest, was doing backflips. So I, I'm going to be all confuddled. I'm going to be confuddled this evening, I think. And, uh, and Neil's going to be my rock with asking uh, questions and me not, you know, getting tongue tied with it. We have uh, the very iconic. I mean, one of for me, one of the most iconic people within uh, the paranormal. We have. Uh, are we still Reverend Lionel? Are we? Uh, can we still use that title? Well, I'm. Uh, I could use it. But I'm no longer in the church in Wales, which I was served in for about 30 years. And uh, I, I am a mem member of two much smaller churches, one of which is the uh, Templar Church. And the uh, because I was in the Templar organization for years. And uh, the, the other one is the ULC, which is the Universal Life Church. And they're basically just a small group of friends who like to worship together, talk theology together, and as and when we can, help people in need together, which is what we try to do. So I would still stick to my title, even though I'm no longer in the church in Wales. I think I think that that's how people uh, do know you um, and and um, know you as Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe, um, and that with the Reverend people will go, oh yeah, you know, yeah. Um, that's that's who we're talking about. And I've got to mention a couple of things before we get going on on the interview. And the first one is that to jog people's memory, if it needs jogging, because I'm I'm sure it probably doesn't, but uh, you are definitely known for your uh, daredevil stunts on the on the old Harley Davidson, uh, driving with the uh, riding around with the leather jacket. On, which is just an iconic image that we, we all have of you and also you work on 14 tv i think it's um that was such a, a cult program and, and one which really captured the imagination of people in the 90s and that's just come out again hasn't it on on dvd yes i brought it out as a dvd which uh, makes me very happy it's uh, um it, it's it's rather like the uh, the reversal of the aging process i look at myself on that and i think Oh, I don't think I've changed too much. <laughs> I don't though, think you have. Even though I was 88 last birthday, which was February the 9th, just gone. I know. It's it's absolutely incredible because I I um I don't think you've aged that much either. I, I'm gonna Thank ask you. I'm gonna ask you afterwards, uh, after we stop recording about what your beauty regime is for that, because I, I need what some of whatever you're having in life, definitely. Um from that, uh, we will get back to talking about 14 TV and and then the massive hit that it was. Um, you know, it started off very much as an underground cult thing, but um, cult's not quite the right word. It was it was very hip to watch 14 TV when I was a teenager. You know, if you were you were in a good crowd, if people knew what it was. I want to start off um, the interview really as we always do, um, and asking the sort of general question of, um, can you think about? because you have a massive spanning career within in the paranormal um, and, and we'll get into that in, and break that down in more detail. But can you think of like one or two incidents that were particularly strange and particularly weird uh, throughout your, your career that you've come across? Well, one of the strangest that uh, just bubbles its way up to the top of my memory as I listen to your question is that we were doing the, the series uh, television series, which was called Castles of Horror, and we'd gone to Wavelsburg in Germany. Now, you know, when you're making television programmes, especially as part of a series, your sound engineer and uh, your film man, your cameraman, um, both become close personal friends, which you're in every situation together. And they were too, as well as the I would describe them as highly skilled technicians. They were very good at what they did in that technical sense. And they were also good personal friends. We always, when we finished, when uh, when the director and the producer were happy with everything, the three of us would go off and have a beer somewhere before we sailed back to um, 
get ready for the next show. And we went uh, in this Castles of Horror um, series, we had gone to Wavelsburg. Now, Wavelsburg was very strange, and I read up all the history about it at the time before we presented the interior and exterior of the castle. And in the lower levels, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them dungeons, but we might call them the, the lower chambers of the castle. Uh, in the Middle Ages, right up to 17th, 18th century, there had been covens of witches uh, occupying those lower chambers of Favelsburg Castle. And the suggestion was that the owners of the castle, who also had military commitments, were trying to persuade, entice, otherwise encourage this local coven of witches to give their magical support when they went into battle. So that was what the witches were doing down there. And then uh, it had also, uh, in Nazi times, there had been prisoners kept there and the uh, Nazi hierarchy had used the castle and uh, Himmler was particularly associated with it during the war. And so there had been all sorts of cruelty and ill treatment of prisoners during that period. And a number of people, I go back to my cameraman and my sound engineer, who, as I said, as well as being good personal friends and expert technicians, were the kind of friends you would describe as rational, sensible uh, men of the world, matter of fact, guys. And we went up at the director's uh, command to do some shots on the very uppermost floor, out in the open roof, with the battlements all around us. And he wanted us to do one of the pieces there with me talking about what the castle had been used for in the Middle Ages and what the Nazis had done in there. As we came up, and got onto this flat roof just behind the battlements. Both my cameraman and my sound engineer, because we were such good close friends and we could talk, talk to each other, both of them said, very frankly, Lionel, we are scared stiff. There is something, God knows what, but there is something incredibly evil on this roof. Can we get this in one shot and get off it? We are terrified. Well, when two very sensible blokes who you've worked with for several months and know as, as good rational friends, when they say that in a voice of genuine fear, now, I couldn't feel anything. There was but I was aware of their feelings because we were such close friends. And I said, yes, well, I said, I'll, uh, I'll do an exorcism before we start, if you feel as bad as that. So I blessed some water. There, was, uh, there were gutterings around so we could get some water. Took some water in the palm of one hand and blessed it and sprinkled it all around the area where we were filming. And uh, as I said, the prayers of exorcism. And they both said, that feels better. It feels like a shield. Mm. And I said, well, in the psychic sense, that's what an exorcism is, mm. that you dispel something that you don't want, something that, for want of a better term, you could call an evil spirit. And uh, so we, we did the shot and uh, got down off the roof. And once we got down off the roof, they were... Uh, explicit again about saying, God, it was terrible up there. And when I thought maybe this was where Himmler had prisoners shot and in terror of their lives, prisoners fell dead on that roof. Or what a few centuries earlier, what those witches had been doing and what incantations they'd been coming up with down in the, the, the sub cellars and the dungeons below the castle. So that's one of the 
most peculiar sensations I've ever gone through mm-hmm. with uh, with my two pals when we were filming there on, uh, at Davelsburg. So, so Lionel, can I can I can I just ask you about that? Yeah, like. in, in, what, what, what do you think? that in terms of what that energy was or, or whatever it was, do you think that those, whatever bad things had happened there had been perhaps recorded, like, you know, the stone tape theory into that that location? Or do you think there were some kind of, you know, whatever you want to call them, non, uh, non-human intelligent entities there who were causing that that feeling? What, 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 what's, your, what's your thought on that? I think that, both of those possibilities are very probable and very realistic. There are haunted houses I've visited over the last 60 or 70 years where you do feel that there is something trapped in the stone, Mm -hmm. that whatever psychic powers and influences exist. Well, let's go on to an extremely simple one that perhaps all of our viewers and listeners are familiar with. Go back to our school days and you have at least one or two teachers and quite often the head teacher and the deputy head teacher who strike terror into the children that we were all those years ago. I can remember um, I went to Hammond's Grammar School and uh, we had a headmaster there called um, Wellborn and uh, Mr. Wellborn was absolutely terrifying and if you got sent to his study if you'd misbehaved in class you got sent to the headmaster's study you were uh, your your knees were literally knocking before you get there now in that case with a man like him or with um other dominating and cruel individuals like some of the nazi leaders would have been there seems to be coming out of them the ability to frighten people, the ability to overawe people. And so you've got um, a negative, evil, psychic force coming out of a being, either a psychic being, a spiritual being, or even a certain type of human being. But the other factor is that over all those years that Patricia and I have been researching, we have gone to particular places or sites allegedly haunted or with a reputation for uh, being an evil place, where it seems that whatever force is there has soaked into the stone, that it's in, you know, you can go into an ancient castle or an ancient hall or an ancient country court, and you would find there you, you know, you say to each other as you're going, well, wow, there's an atmosphere in there. Mm. And sometimes it can be uh, a very beautiful atmosphere. It can be a place where an artist or a poet um, or a very happy couple have lived and enjoyed raising their family and had a wonderful time there. And their happiness has also soaked into the stone and wood of their home so that the fabric of a building uh, can, um, I think, absorb, and so can certain individual things. You can um, you can look at an axe in the Tower of London and think that blade severed human heads, and that would have absorbed the determination of the executioner and the coldness of the executioner, and it would at the same time have absorbed the end-of-life terror of the man or woman who was about to be executed, so that either an object or um, a building, and sometimes it, it could apply to clothing. It might be a suit of armor, a shield, a breastplate, and so Material objects, whether they be small and able to hold in your hand, or whether they be a room or an entire castle, can absorb these powerful human emotions. And uh, as I said, in, in some lovely places, um, I know we 
visited some buildings that had been associated with Wordsworth up in the Lake District. And there was a feeling of affection, um, art, beauty, love, and all of the good things that Wordsworth wrote about. They were there. They'd, they'd somehow escaped into the building and into the desk he had once sat at when he was writing. So I could answer yes to both of what you said, Neil, that it can be a psychic being that is there causing the problem, or it can be that from a particularly potent psychic being, this force has got into the fabric. And again, our levels of sensitivity differ my two pals, who were, you know, my cameraman and my uh, sound recordist, um, they seemed to be, perhaps because they were artists and craftsmen in their own strength, they seemed to be more receptive, more vulnerable to what was there. Now, I have always seen myself, um, if you can characterize yourself, in these psychic encounters, I've always seen myself more as a Templar priest than uh, as a warrior priest. And uh, I don't, I just, where as some highly sensitive, highly intelligent people are affected by an evil force in the fabric or in a, an evil being. Um, and where they feel terror, I tend to feel um, anger, mm -hmm. uh, aggression. And I think you come and try and frighten me, mate, and I'll show you what hell looks like. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would, I would, yeah. that, that really leads on to, to one, one of the questions um, that just you talking about that has, has sparked in me about, have you ever been frightened for, for, the, for the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours that you've, thousands of hours that you've put into um, research and investigation. Have you ever been scared by anything, if not for yourself, for somebody else in a situation? No, I'm just trying to think. Bear with me while I just glance through a sheaf of my notes from... Now, here, here's one. Mm -hmm. Bear with me in that I may need to just glance at my notes. Of course, yeah, please do. A long time. Um, this is about the Skirid Mountain. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know that one? Yeah. Sorry, uh, I, I, I missed that. What, what, what was that line? The Skirid, it's S K I double R I D. The Skirid Mountain Inn. And to give it its full title, it's situated in Thlanfi Hangel, Krukomni, which is a picturesque little Welsh village. Abergavenny in Monmouthshire lies just a few miles to the south of it. And the Skirid is estimated to be one of the oldest pubs in the UK. It dates back at least to the start of the 12th century, and it could well be considerably older. The famous Owen Glendower used the Skirid in the 15th century when he rallied his warriors there before riding out to attack the adherents of the English king Henry IV reign from 1399 till 1413. And uh, there are also stories that the notorious, you know, we all know of him, Hanging Judge Jeffreys, one of the cruelest men who ever sat in law, once condemned prisoners to death in the Skiri. There are reports from witnesses who claim that his troubled spirit is among those that walk among the ghosts in the evening. And the ghost of John Prowther, who was hanged for sheep stealing, has also been reported there, as has the ghost of the hangman who carried out the sentence on John. Another curious legend attached to the skirry concerns Rudolf Hess, who was in the military hospital at Abergavenny, recovering from a serious leg injury during World War II. It was claimed that he was allowed to exercise 
under strict supervision and that a sympathetic custodian had once bought him a drink in the spirit. Consequently, there have been a few reports since his death in 1987 that his uns unhappy spirit has been sighted wandering on the mountains not far from the skirid and we were doing a program about it and I was in there and I certainly um, I would be a little hesitant about saying I was actually frightened or afraid but I was aware very strongly that there was something extraordinarily evil and strange, something abnormal in the Skirid Inn, and that whether it had soaked itself into the fabric, as we were discussing earlier, or whether it was some evil spirit, um, someone perhaps like Rudolf Hess, who was in the, in the area, that they had failed to go away. So that, um, that is a place that I would say for anyone who is um, an enthusiastic psychic investigator and who would like to experience some very odd feelings of, of psychic power and psychic presence, go to the Skirid because that was a place in which I most certainly experienced it. And um, perhaps I was afraid. It's, um, if, I, if I think back to my um, army career, I was uh, a lieutenant in a uh, light infantry unit, which eventually got absorbed into the Royal Anglians, but we were uh, on, the, on the Eastern Counties. And, there were times when we were on exercises and we were taking it very seriously and we were doing sort of mock battles and you had to be extremely careful because you didn't know where the opposing force had stationed their blokes and you didn't want to walk um you know innocently into a dangerous area where they were waiting for you get a couple of blanks going off in your ear and the uh, referee saying, I'm sorry, sir, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> but the feeling that you got in that kind of exercise, when you knew the ground was dangerous, if you were holding one area of land, you'd been, um, you'd been consigned to defend that area. And uh, two or three other officers and 40 or 50 of their men were defending another area and attacking you on these expeditions you you would have some sort of uh, an old cardboard box tied up and that was supposed to be some incredible secret weapon that must not fall into the hands of the enemy and so you had to, you had to try and guard this thing while at the same time getting through their lines to pick up their cardboard box and uh, it meant a lot to you at the time you wanted to you wanted the commendation of the colonel <laughs> uh, when you were a young, young, young lieutenant, the commendation of the colonel meant a lot to you. Uh, but I, said, I wouldn't call it fear, but I'd call it, you know, when you're trying to lead your men through the enemy lines, is it a mixture of fear and caution, or does fear stimulate the caution? Does it uh, prompt the way that you're going to act? So I would say, yes, that's probably the nearest I've been to saying, yes, I was afraid. Uh, uh, well, OK, OK, so that, that's that's a perfect segue, Lionel, into talking about things that you might be afraid of. Although I think you're going to say on this next subject that you, you haven't been afraid and it's um, your work, um, your sometime work as an exorcist. Now, I, I've been reading. Uh, this is a slightly left field, but I'll, I'll come back. Come back. You know, give me thirty seconds, and I'll be back on to, on to exorcism. I've been reading um, some essays by a retired psychotherapist called Jerry Marzinski. He's an American, and he's worked, or, or before he retired, he worked for several decades in psychiatric units 
in um, in various American states, and most especially with paranoid schizophrenics. Right. Now, Jerry Masinski has come to the conclusion over that time, in fact, he came to it very quickly when he started working with them, that the usual you know, reductionist materialist version of what schizophrenic is. They're just hearing audial hallucinations, these usually very nasty uh, audial hallucinations, telling them to do things, although they're not very good people. Um, but he went in a completely different direction and very convincingly says that, no, these are real demonic entities. And if you want to cure that schizophrenic or at least make their life bearable, you need to do something about these demonic entities which are ruining their lives. And that, of course, it, it, Jerry Mazinski never uses the term exorcism, but to me, what he's doing seems like an, an exorcism. So, sorry, sorry, that's a bit of a, a, a long ramble, but I, I wanted to just, you know, give that as an example of a psychotherapist and how they work and how they've seen demonic entities whatever they are and then come back to you Lionel to say you know in your work with exorcism you know what's going on what 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 do you think is going on when you are, uh, are carrying out that exorcism well I would begin by saying that if you are using exorcism in the conventional sense it is the driving force the getting rid of the cleaning from, the purifying of, so that there is something evil there. And I need to digress just a little bit to talk about um, what we think uh, an actual personality is. Now, I know that the mind is associated very closely with the brain, that uh, if there is brain damage in a, in a physical accident, then the personality will sometimes be very sadly changed, or it will be limited, or it will lose some of its former abilities. But the mind is not, in my book, the mind is not the brain. It's a psychic entity. and. Um, the thing that I would, for want of a better word, just refer to as me um, or your personality uh, or Kate's personality, the, the real man, the real woman, um, we are not dependent on the brain as it's carefully encased inside the skull. We are, uh, we use it. I like to think of the mind using the brain as you or I would use a computer and that the, the computer operator is not part of the computer. Um, in the same way, uh, you might think of it as someone driving a racing car. The, the most brilliant driver, the, the great Sterling Moss, was not part of the car. It was the thing he used to achieve the high speed, um, but it wasn't part of him physically. There are expert drivers who do feel when they're driving that the, the vehicle is almost part of themselves. And there's a, you know, a really expert driver um, will say, yeah, well, I'll, I can handle this thing through heavy traffic because it's almost part of me. But that's the almost that makes the difference. It, uh, you're separate. The driver is separate from the car. The computer engineer is separate from the computer. And the mind, uh, the real Neil, the real Kate, the real Lionel, is separate from the computer, separate from the brain, which we have between our ears. Now, having looked into that, if we, as human personalities, as friends working together to investigate the paranormal, the it's the mind, it's the personality, it's the non-physical, abstract self, the identity, um, which is the real person. Now, if we exist as psychic entities, non-physical entities, then 
I would suggest that it's rational and reasonable to suggest that there are other entities. And we know from our travels around the world and our investigations of history that you've got people like Hitler, Mussolini, Jack the Ripper, um, Sweeney Todd, uh, all sorts of characters who can be just as we do our best to do good, to feed the hungry and to heal the sick and to comfort the lonely. There are those who seek to do evil, who enjoy the pain and suffering that they can inflict on others. It gives them a, a sense of power, a feeling of uh, assertiveness. It gives them a feeling that they are superior to the, the person they are causing the damage to. Now, if we think in this sense of good and bad individuals as human beings, then we can think that there are things that are even worse, that there are, for want of a better term, that there are devils and demons and imps, whatever name we like to give to them, whatever name we've given them in folklore, that there are evil personalities, evil forces that are probably self-aware. When we read something like um, the, uh, we'll read something like uh, any book on the spiritual travels, even if something like Pilgrim's Progress, uh, if we read a book of that kind where somebody has made a spiritual journey and has encountered evil beings who are trying to interrupt his progress, stop him, throw him back, then I think we can say that when I'm called on to perform an exorcism, then what I do if, again, I've had cases where someone has come to me and has said that they feel there are forces, powers, they wouldn't call them instincts, they would call them intrusions that are coming into their mind, into their personality, and prompting them to behave in ways which they would never do by themselves, that they would never do morally. And uh, when I performed an exorcism on somebody who has come to me and, and said, Father, I feel that there are some evil forces. They have perhaps read passages in the New Testament where Jesus has healed those who were possessed by demons who were could be described as mentally ill, could by people like us who are prepared to accept the existence of evil psychic forces, that these things are causing, and I will then use a, a form of prayer, of exorcism, to drive this unwanted lodger out of the person who has come to me for help. I would use it on the lines of, Lord, we pray that Brother X here or Sister X shall be healed, that evil is attacking them. We call upon you and the holy angels to defend them, to drive away the evil spirit, and then to protect this man whom I am blessing and protecting now. And I have, very happy to say, I have had, I mustn't exaggerate, perhaps in the course of all the years that I've done this, maybe as many as a dozen whom I have healed in that way and who have remained healed, who have come back the following week and said, Father, after you said those prayers for me, that awful instinct I had, um, it sometimes happens with someone who is uh, a drug addicted and wants to get rid of the feelings of addiction. Now, a psychologist might argue that I, as a priest, as a, a sort of, in inverted commas, an authority figure, <laughs> 
uh, have come up to the, the victim and that because they in their minds are interpreting the situation as I have been to a priest and this priest has healed me and I therefore feel better. And so it could, in psychological terms, be rather like the, you know, the way that a stage hypnotist will sometimes work with a volunteer on stage and say, you have just turned into a dog. Mm -hmm. Run across the stage and the poor bloke will go down on all fours and run across the stage. Or he may say that, uh, uh, you know, you're working in... Uh, you're working in a clothing factory and you're working a loom or you're working a spinning wheel. And, the, and he said, you can feel it. You have, and the, the poor hypnotized subject on the stage will start doing this as if he has got a spinning wheel there. And it's not until the hypnotist says, now everything is back to normal. You've left the factory. You feel fine and normal again. And you're just going to walk home. And when you talk to one of the volunteers who's been helping the stage hypnotist, he will say, I really could see that spinning wheel that I was turning. And now this is the, the power of the mind. You know, we have really vivid dreams and uh, they become so real that uh, we're very glad when they stop. And uh, I've, the most recent, let me just use as an example, the most recent of that kind that I've had was that, um, because uh, as you know, I'm a martial arts instructor, mm -hmm. and uh, that just a few, in the dream, which was so vivid, it seemed like real life. I was walking home from the shops, heard a scream for help, and we live in number 48, and I was just passing number 30. And as I passed, the, uh, the poor girl and her husband who lived there were being attacked by three sort of street hoodlums um, who were carrying knives, and they were just screaming for help. And... Uh, the vividness of the dream was so real, I thought I was really doing it while the dream was persisting. And being a fifth Dan Black Belt, I simply sailed it, despite being 88, I just sailed into these three bad guys and left them unconscious on the pavement, picked their knives out of their hands and dropped them down the drain. And the, uh, the, the poor people that I'd rescued, uh, they had... Um, a very loving daughter who came to our house the following morning with her, uh, her sort of working clothes on and her working tools and said to Patricia, because Lionel saved my parents, whom I love so much, may I be your servant and come every day of the week and clean the house for you? And we both said, oh, yes, please. <laughs> now, that dream has recurred on perhaps five or six occasions, and it doesn't alter. Now, I would be very interested to know what it is and why, what is, I, I believe in the idea of us having subconscious messages that the mind is trying to tell us in picture form. And the dream seems to be saying, somebody needs rescuing. I have whatever is needed, as I said, old as I am, if you're, if you're a fifth stand black belt, you're still pretty handy, no matter how old you are. And uh, so I used, used that as a symbol, I used as some skill or ability that I got that would deliver somebody from a problem that they were enduring. And then I'm rewarded by this very nice girl who comes up and says to my wife, um, I love my parents so much and you've saved them. Um, I can't thank you enough. You've given me back the lives that I love. They might otherwise have been killed. Mm. Um, may I now give you a little bit of my life in return for, may I come and do any cleaning your wife would like done once a week? I said, yes, of course you can. We'd, we'd be delighted. That's very nice of you to be so grateful. 
And I, I also sort of stressed it. I said, I, I wasn't doing it for what I was doing it because if I see bad guys, I like to get rid of them. But if I, if I see good, decent, lovable people being threatened by the, the said bad guys, I'm going to rush in them, uh, even if I'm 90 or 100. <laughs> like the old Chinese grandmasters, you know, they're, they're still deadly when they're, uh, when they're three, <laughs> when they made it to five score. Mm. So, so is so is that how you see you know go, you know talking about about the exorcism, yes, using those dreams as like an an uh, uh, um, an allegory or is it an analogy? Yeah, an it's analogy. It's quite kind of both. Um, yeah. but it, but it's in when you're doing the exorcism, are you is that what you're you personally are getting from it in that you know that you are, are helping those people and just just as a second question when you do that exorcism and whatever we want to call them a malig malignant entity is, is yes. dispatched uh, where do you think they go well, that is a wonderful question um i would say that coming back to my earlier point that although we need the human brain just as a computer operator needs a computer or a driver needs a car and um, I would say that these beings, these evil beings, these negative beings, um, we, all of us, you, me, Kate, and uh, anyone who is either supplying a need or who has a need, that personality lives in um, what I would describe of I can't find a better word, as a sort of psychic. If we think of some recent research that was done under uh, the glaciers, in, under the ice, and all kinds of life forms were found there, and all kinds of life forms have been found on the, in the depth of the seabed. And these little chaps... Um, have their own lives, live in their own environment. Now, if we can think of a psychic equivalent of living on the seabed, living in the ice, living on the top of Mount Everest, if we think of an environment in which the creatures suited to and adapted to that environment can live happily, peacefully and comfortably, then there is a psychic environment. This is my theory. In which your soul and mine and Kate's and all of the friends and family that we know and love live in the, the psychic parts of us, lives in this psychic environment, just as fish live in the sea and birds live in the air. And what I feel is that when we drive out, uh, and this is something that we need to be extremely careful about, if we drive out, some dark, evil psychic force, uh, the sort of demon that, as in the New Testament accounts, the demons that possess the victims from whom Jesus drove them out, that they are on the loose in this environment. And so the church's top exorcists would make sure that the demonic entity which they've driven out is not driven out into freedom. Mm. It's rather like if you are a caring exorcist and want to protect everyone from these dark forces, that you are rather like a prison officer. You're getting rid of the convict from prison A, you don't just open the door and let him go, you put him into prison B or prison C. We must take, and in a, a lot of prayers of exorcism, there is a reference to this, that uh, I cast you out of this victim, but I do not set you free. You must go into a quiet and lonely place where there are no other beings mm. whom you can attack and damage. 
you 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 can actually say you can send them to the Sargasso Sea. You you can send them. You you can drive them um, to the heart of the of the desert of the uh, you know, Sardinian Sardinian desert, so that they have to be in a in a full and complete and good and professional exorcism. They have to be put in some place where they can do no harm. They need to be relocated in a place where they cannot damage another human mind or soul. Mm, definitely. Um, leading on to that, we, we you know we we are talking about sort of these non non human energies that exist um, in the world. I've got to ask you because um, it's a, a passion of mine and, and Neil's. What are your thoughts on um, fairies and folklore? Where where does that fit into the sort of Fortean um, world for you? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I start, I think I can best answer the question by starting with the idea that the world, which I believe was created by God our Father, um, that the world is an incredibly, unimaginably complicated and uh, exciting place that it contains far more mysteries than uh, this human mind that I've got can uh, encounter at once. That, that there's more mystery out there than I can understand. And so by starting off with the idea that we have a very, very mysterious universe to live in. Then the idea of the creatures that we meet in folklore, I would tend to go back because in time, because the most exciting folklore is extremely old. Mm. And it may well be that among our ancestors, our remote ancestors, there were those gifted leaders, teachers, healers, who were aware that there were far more things in the universe and that they weren't all good. There were fairies, for example, who almost, in one sense, resembled butterflies and moths. They were about that size. And if you could imagine a, a beautiful little creature but not much bigger uh, than a red admiral butterfly, which had nevertheless um, a mind and uh, the ability to think and was also good and could be asked to give help, to give healing, to give leadership, to guide someone who's lost, to heal someone who's sick. And then there are the gnomes who are perhaps uh, less benign, but uh, who are more or less like us. They're a mixture. And that you can sometimes come across these strange little people. I've, I couldn't swear to it, but because it might have been the effect of the hot weather. There's a place in Norfolk, so we're always brought up, which is called Ringland Hills. It's a little village, goes down to the river and uh, you can go down there and hire a, a little boat, a canoe or a punt and go down the river towards the coast and have a wonderful time on a lovely summer day. And there were on Ringland, which is just a lonely hills where you can walk and there are gorse bushes everywhere and all sorts of other lovely plants. And I once thought that I saw a little creature, no more than three or four inches high, but in human form. And as I was looking down among the leaves, just admiring the plants, this little chap scuttled away. He was, he was out of sight in five seconds. But I always wondered whether I really did see it or whether it was a hot summer's day, sun beating down on my head if I hadn't got a hat on, and the brain will do all sorts, will prompt you to all sorts of things. So I have never 
actually said, yes, I have seen one. But I was so interested in what I thought I saw that I would not deny an account that someone else gave me that he or she had seen a fairy like a butterfly flying from one bloom to another, or that he'd seen one of these quaint little men about three inches high scuttling among the, the gorse bushes in a place like Wingham. That's the only place I ever had an experience like that. And I do just wonder whether if it wasn't the the sun affecting my head when I was on a hot summer day, that it might just have been something that we haven't got booked in the scientific textbooks, that there are other beings and uh, that perhaps the fairy tales of gnomes and dwarves and elves and fairies, um, whether there may be some tiny fragment of truth in the real world. And that, of course, brings us to the huge question of how many parallel universes are there? <laughs> and is it possible that these merry little chaps and the fairies are in a parallel universe? And that just occasionally those parallel universes slide together, somebody slips through and then goes back. And if you happen to be the lucky man or woman who's standing at that conjunction, then maybe you'll see something inexplicable. Mm. It is such, yeah. a, such a curious world, isn't it, that we live in? And there is so, so many possibilities. And I think that that's what makes it an exciting world, that there are so many possibilities. Uh, I do want to ask you two, two questions both totally unrelated, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you. I'll ask you all first, and then and then we'll, we'll get on for a second. I promise I'll do my best. I know you will. I know you will. Um, so the first one is uh, that was a lovely account, by the way, and I, I loved listening to you talk about about the fairies. It, it was so delightful. Um, I just want to because I'm I'm very mindful of, of time, but I want to get quite a lot in. Um, I want to talk to you about um, just the, the open question of what it was like uh, working on 14 TV for you know for from looking in from the outside because we have to talk about it. it's the it's it's very iconic, but from looking in as a viewer, it looked like such a good fun program to work on oh i enjoyed it i think perhaps more than any other program i've ever made and if uh, if the producers and directors ever want to do some more they know where to find me do and it. I, I'd, be, I'd be delighted to do another series and uh, it was it was, it was the whole 40, you know, it's based on the name of Charles Fort, who was uh, an investigator of unsolved mysteries, um, probably reached his climax back in the late 20s, early 30s. And his whole philosophy was um, nothing is impossible. If you are told about something that sounds impossible, go and investigate for yourself. And that was what Charles Fort, the great investigator, did. And that was what inspired our programme. And my director, my producer, myself, and my colleagues, um, we uh, all set out with that basic frame of mind that if we had heard that, uh, as I was telling you about with the, um, the Skirid Inn and... Uh, there's, for instance, another just very brief example. There's a pub in Norwich called the, and I'm an old Norfolkman, so I know it. Um, the Adam and Eve pub is one of the oldest inns in Britain. And Lord Sheffield himself died there in the middle of the 16th century. And there are reports of his continual spectral presence in this very ancient pub. So there's that's the sort of thing that we would want to go straight away, say to the landlord, may we set our cameras up? We're trying to find Lord Sheffield. And another one is the Maid's Head Hotel, which is in Doomland, in Norwich, in Norfolk. That one is allegedly haunted by a spectre that resembles an elderly woman in grey, 
But what makes that particular haunting and the reports of it unusually interesting, anybody who sees her gliding through comments on the strong smell of lavender that accompanies her. Now, very few ghosts carry smells with them, but this marvellous old lady who haunts the maid's head in Tombland is, um, is highly scented. <laughs> so that, um, you know, that, that sort of that sort of haunted factor would be what attracts us to go and investigate further. Was there anything particularly un unusual that stands out for you about um, you, the research that you did for 14 TV? What, you know, have you, was there something that was kind of like so strange and so weird that um, that you were, you know, really super excited uh, to, to go and investigate it? Yeah, well, one of the things that, one of the things that I found particularly interesting and uh, went to investigate, um, concerned my theory, my interest, my idea that people who are otherwise perfectly normal can be overtaken by something evil, which transforms their personality and transforms this. Um, the first reports of Spring Hill Jack yes. came from 1817. Mm -hmm. And in 1837, some 20 years later, he was seen in Barnes Common where he was jumping over the cemetery wall. Now, that was quite a height. And from a standing start to jump a seven foot wall, you've got to be a rather unusual character. Then at the start of Victoria's reign, he attacked a girl called Polly Adams, tore her dress with hands that she described as more like iron claws. And she described him to the police and her friends and those who went to try and hunt him up to attack her as very strong, despite having a very thin body. She also noted that he had very prominent eyes and pointed ears. Now, that almost brings us back to what we were discussing about elves and fairies and the little people and the, 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 that had these pointed ears and rather strange eyes. So um, if I think to any of the places such as that that I've visited, I'm just having a quick look through my notes for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I love that the, your life has been so jam packed that you 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 know you have to keep um, records because you must have done so so much. So yeah, over over seventy years. And I said I was I so blessed um, that Patricia is just as interested. And when I say I have no fear of strange places and strange things and perhaps strange beings. Uh, she doesn't either. She's extremely practical. Mm -hmm. When we'd arranged to come on and do this Zoom with you tonight, I needed her to set the television up for me. <laughs> she's, uh, she's my super technician as well as my uh, super wife. Now, I had a look at uh, some of the, the, the ghosts in the, the city of York which again, so we looked at some of that on the 14 TV. On misty evenings, the ghostly apparition of a girl carrying a child have been reported from the A64 Malton Road in York. Tradition says that she was murdered by her highwayman boyfriend a few centuries ago. Witnesses have reported seeing the spectre of a girl watching funerals from the church door as the funeral party approaches. And that's at All Saints Church 
in the pavement in the city of York. Now, those are looking at the things we've investigated on Forte and TV. What dear old Charles Fort always used to try to do was to look for the inexplicable. He was a great he was a great observer and a very careful man. He would have it had been like Darwin in some ways if he'd been investigating biology. But he investigated the unusual, the paranormal, the insoluble, because he believed very firmly that there is an answer to everything. And although he spent his time hunting through the paranormal, it was in the way that a chemist would analyze chemical compounds, the way that a physicist would understand the laws of motion, or the way that the biologist would look at um, how animals had evolved and what powers they had. So when we were doing our best to keep true to the 40 and approach to mystery, we tried to do that, that we would look for mystery and we would try and put up half a dozen possible um, uh, uh, solutions. But what, uh, shall we say, left us feeling satisfied was that when none of the blessed solutions <laughs> really answered it. And, uh, I do admire Charles Fort for his, um, for how he records phenomena uh, in the simple fact where a lot of people at the time would have dismissed people as being kooks or dismissed um, any kind of phenomena that was outside a certain range of, of maybe hauntings, anything that went outside those parameters. And he he reported it in such a way that he he reported what he knew of the case and he left left out um, harmful opinion, if you like, of, of a case. And he, he did take it as a very scientific view. And I, and yes, I, really, I really admire that about his work. Yes. I, I, I would he... like to, I'm sorry, Neil, I'm, I'm kind of... Oh, no. I've, I've, I've dominated this last bit. Um, I, I do want to talk about, just before we let you go, because, you know, you've been absolutely brilliant, but I do want to talk a little bit, and I know it's a massive, massive uh, part of your life, and it's something that I only recently found out about. The, the you are um, perhaps uh, the world's most prolific sci-fi writer, and that was another thing, you know, with the, when I found out that you were a fifth Dan, I was like, is there nothing this man can't do? And and the sci-fi writing is is, you, you know, you would just you just literally churn out good sci-fi um, pieces of writing. Where how do you find the energy first of all for for everything that you do? Because you know you're not not stopping anytime soon. Um, oh, no. ret retirement's not even on your agenda by the looks of it, which is marvelous. So where where did the sci-fi start, start? Was it in conjunction with, with the whole paranormal thing? Was it something separate? Well, I, I sold the first of my science fiction stories in 1952 when I was 17. And I think, I think, and you'll find this explanation, I think, humorous. I did not like school. And I particularly did not like Latin uh, because it was difficult. And I did not like advanced mathematics. And uh, so if there was some uh, new branch of maths being pumped into us, it was a very old fashioned school building. It, it was Hammond's Grammar School in Swaffham. And it went right back to the 1600s, 1700s. And it had, accordingly, a library which had a lot of great big tall library shelves. And the master on duty sat at the far end marking books or whatever he was doing. And I found that the safest place to get and not be found was to go into the library and to go as far as I could from the master at the front desk and hide between two of these big upright library shelves. And of course, if you're hiding down there for a couple of lessons, you look around and you find a book, which you withdraw from the shelf and read. 
And the place where I hid had books by Jules Verne, books by H.G. Wells, and books by other science fiction, early uh, horror writers and science fiction writers. And this would be that I left school in 1949-50, and I got the idea from reading H.G. Wells' short stories that there was a very mysterious universe. I knew that he was writing fiction, but I thought the real universe could be even more mysterious than what Wells is writing. And so when I did finally leave, I started writing science fiction. And to my unbelievable delight, I managed to sell one to a company called John Spencer and Company, who did Badger Books, and uh, they were in London. And to my great amazement, they were paying, I mean, it's nothing today, but they were paying 10 shillings a thousand. And I had then started working for um, a dentist where I was learning to be, I'd been trained as a dental technician to make vulcanite dentures. That was before plastic ones came in. And so uh, in the uh, apprenticeship situation, I was getting 10 shillings a week, which was 50 pence. And I thought, I need more than this. And I sold this story of about 5,000 words. So we got about £2.50 for it. And that was the equivalent of a month's wages, uh, 10 shillings a week. And I thought, hey, this is good. So I started writing some more. And I, I can still remember the plot of the first one I wrote. It was called Worlds Without End. And I was also going through religious and philosophical thoughts at the time. As you do in your teens, you wonder what the universe is really like, really like. And what I did in the story, you know, your subconscious feelings come out in your stories. And I had a Christian space pilot who had been ordered by the government to take his ship and fly until he found the edge of the universe. They said to him, but well, they didn't like him because he was a Christian, they said, uh, you'll probably crash into it and die. Uh, but he said, if you don't find the edge of the universe, you can come back and tell us that it has no limits. And therefore, there was no God to create it. It just sprang into existence on its own. So there's this poor chap with this awful theological and philosophical problem in his mind. If the universe was made by God and has boundaries, he will crash into one of them and be killed. If it has no boundaries, then there was no God that he believed in, so his life worth living. And I resolved the story by having him get as far as he could on a fueling gun. And suddenly, out of the darkness of the sky comes a gigantic hand, which picks up his spaceship very gently, turns it round and takes it back to Earth. <laughs> and uh, the voice of God said, I do exist. Now tell these other people that I'm here. Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. That was the plot. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, it showed my theological and philosophical groupings as a teenager. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's great. I, I must get. I must get hold of a copy. I'm, I'm sure. I, I guess it's out of print, but that that sounds right it, up my street. It, it, if you contact uh, my friend Mark, Mark Jones, um, who's my agent, um, he'll be able to find one for you. Brilliant. We'll do yeah. that definitely. I think. I think we've probably got time for for the last little bit to wrap this up. I, literally, we could. We could literally sit back and listen to you all evening, you know. You, you... I, I just, I just want to say, Kate, you know, but it's, uh, you know, before you wrap it up, it's, uh, I, I have all of these topics that I've written down <laughs> before we started talking, and you know, I really love to hear what you have to think about them, and uh, I think I've only got through two of them. <laughs> <laughs> Two out, two out of ten. Well, you know, you know what that means, though, Lionel. We're going to have to get you back on the show because Neil's not got through his questions. 
I would love to come back on the show. I've greatly enjoyed talking to you. You're both lovely people. And, oh, bless you. Uh, I'm honoured to be invited. So whenever you want me, just give me a whistle. Next All week, right. then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you fix it up with Mark, and, uh, you know, my agent, he'll make it all happen for you. Brilliant. Before you go, though, I do want to be, I was, I was saying that you don't, you don't seem to to stop. You you kind of, you know, you, the long list of things that, you, that you've achieved already, but you're not stopping any, anytime soon. So what what's in the future for you, Lionel? What's coming up for you? Right. Well, the, the one I'm working on at the moment is called The Boy on... I can never remember the name of the village, Bisley. It's up in Gloucestershire. And uh, it's about, it's a, it's a historical mystery. It's a legend in, in the little village of Bisley in Gloucestershire to the effect that Henry VIII was a, fray, was a friend of the Lord of the Manor and had come to stay with him. And Henry VIII, as we know, was a, a rather naughty womanizer. So he sends two of his serv courtier servants to the village pub to uh, tell the landlord that he wants the most attractive of the barmaids to report up to the hall as the king wants something. And uh, the girl um, who is uh, there's one attractive teenage barmaid who, when she realizes that the landlord is under threat from Henry's men. In other words, if you if you don't send me one of your um, barmaids, we will probably come down here and kill you, close your pub. And because she is very fond of him, because she's always been treated well, uh, she says to him, don't let them frighten you. I, I can cope with it. I will go and do my best to please the king. And uh, so she does. She comes back in the morning. And um, without... Uh, uh, worrying at all that she's been with the king, the uh, innkeeper says, I have loved you since the day you came to work for me. Because I'm so much older, I'm older enough to be your father. I haven't proposed to you, but now you've been forced to please the king. Um, will you marry me so that you've got, in case he's made you pregnant, you've got a husband and father to look after you? And she's ecstatic. She says, so good of you. Yes, you don't have to. So they get happily married. And she duly has a son, but it's the king's son. Now, the king, meantime, has been back to the village with daughter Elizabeth, who is the daughter of Mary Antoinette. And uh, he says to the local lord there, uh, I'd like you to look after her because London's a bit dangerous at the moment. We're getting problems with the Spaniards. And Lord Grey, who was the lord of the manor of Bisley, said, yeah, of course I will. Now, the girl, the real Princess Elizabeth, sadly, at the age of 10, picks up malaria and dies. One of the visitors to the estate brings malaria with him from the sea, and she dies. Now, Henry has just said that he's coming over to see how they all are. What the story is about is that they decide, because the son whom the barmaid and her new husband, the landlord, have brought up as theirs, is actually Henry's. And he looks, there are certain facial characteristics that he has, which match up with the poor girl who's now died. So they call in a local priest whom they trust, give her a Christian burial in the chapel on the Bisley estate, so that not nobody knows what's happened to her. And they dress the boy they alter her dresses to a little bigger and they dress the boy as her. So when Henry comes, because of the facial similarities, because they're both his kids, he accepts her as his daughter. And when Henry dies, she, he, becomes Queen Elizabeth I. And there are some interesting bits in history where Elizabeth will never have a doctor to look at her when she's ill. She will never be examined by a doctor, which might indicate that there's something different about the gender. 
And she's also, of course, very tough. And when she drives back the Spanish Inquisition, and she says, although I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, yet I have the heart and stomach of a king, a king of England too. And now this is the sort of thing that a man might say if he's disguised as princess, as Queen Elizabeth. And so this, this story is just based on a legend that Queen Elizabeth was actually male. And... Uh, what the boy does once he's been, once Henry is dead and he's transferred and has become Queen Elizabeth, he gets his real parents into the palace with his mother as the uh, lady in waiting in chief, so that she's there to look after him. And his father, who is an expert on wines and beers, having been a publican, she appoints him as the royal seneschal in charge of the wine. So she's got her parents who know the truth and care about her and do anything for her, um, living in the palace with her and protecting her. And that's that's the legend of the Bisley boy, which is a story I'm writing now. Wow. Absolutely fascinating, isn't it? It's, it's it's great when you get those curious histories as well as, uh, you know, the legends that go with them. That's absolutely yeah. brilliant. Well, we are going to have to wrap it up. I think we all we all need a, a, a cup of tea. We'll, we'll need a break, definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. And like, I'm like, ever so pleased to help you again if you want me. Yes, please do. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Welcome back whenever you want. It's been an it's been a, such a such a pleasure. And uh, Neil will tell you, um, you know how I've been ranting on about you coming on and how excited I've been about you you coming on and chatting with us. Um, it, it, it is such a pleasure to, to listen to you, Lionel. We, we will have you back, definitely. So thank you so, so much for your time. Um, yeah, th thank you very much, Lionel. I really yeah, enjoyed that. I really great, enjoyed it. Very great pleasure, Neil. And thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. OK, guys, so don't forget to, um, I, I always forget to do this, to sub subscribe and hit the bell or whatever you guys do. Um, your comments are always appreciated. We do read them all. And if there's anything that you want us to pass on to Lionel, I know there'll, there'll be a massive amount of fans who will be watching this. Um, all as uh, odd as me, who stayed up very, very late as a teenager to watch 14 TV. So uh, drop your comments below. Let us know what you think. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.